Hello everybody, nice to be with you. Today, I wanted to go over this article with you called Alternative Postmodernism and Unnamed Phenomenon. This is by Alexander Dugan. It was translated, uh, let's see here, by Lorenzo somebody, what's his full name? I apologize. Have to give credit where it's due. Uh, it was translated by Lorenzo Maria Pacini. And this is over at, um, here's where you can find it. If I scroll that up, you should be able to see. Uh, geopolitica, geopolitica with a K, dot ru. This was out uh, a couple of days ago. It's on Alexander Dugan's thoughts on postmodernism, for and against. Uh, kind of, um, what would a right-wing postmodernism be? Why should anybody be attracted to postmodernism? That's the idea of this article. So let's go over it and, uh, and see what he has to say. Alexander Dugan, Deconstructing Postmodernity. Some important aspects of postmodernity should be clarified. It is not a complete phenomenon, and although it was the postmodernists, in particular Derrida, who introduced the notion of deconstruction, based, however, on Heidegger's notion of destruction in Sign and Zeit, being in time, postmodernity itself can be deconstructed and not necessarily in the postmodern style. Postmodernity takes shape on the basis of modernity. In doing so, it partly criticizes modernity and partly continues it. With the development of this trend, what exactly and how it criticizes the modern and what exactly and how it continues it has itself become a kind of philosophical dogma, the attack on which is deliberately forbidden. This is what makes postmodernism such that it is neither good nor bad, but is as it is. Otherwise, the phenomenon would definitely dissolve. Yet this is not the case, and for all the irony, evasiveness, and insincerity of postmodern discourse, there's a very definite core of fundamentals that it never abandons and clearly delineated boundaries beyond which it never goes. If we position ourselves, Dugan writes, at a critically significant distance from this core and freely cross certain forbidden boundaries, we can look at postmodernism from afar and ask the question, is it not possible to take away from postmodernism certain lines that it has borrowed from somewhere and recombine them in a different way than it does itself? And again, is it not possible to ignore certain boundaries and moral imperatives it has established and dismember postmodernity into its constituent parts completely ignoring its inevitable protests and cries of theoretical pain. Those of you who know Dugan's work, I interject here, know that this is a familiar operation of Dugan's. Let's take something, for example, Marxism or fascism or whatever the case happens to be, and let's try to understand it from outside of itself so that we can freely borrow and recombine the elements that it offers us if we find them insightful, useful, uh, philosophically promising, full of potential, and so on. Therefore, he likes to read Marx from the right and Evola from the left. In the fourth political theory book, he does this kind of operation throughout. So now he's going to do it with respect to postmodernism. Dismantling the modern. Why can we love postmodernism? In other words, what is it in postmodernism that we can borrow? I offer the most general considerations on this issue. Let us structure our analysis as follows. First, we will identify those lines of postmodernism that are interesting from the point of view of a radical critique of modernity, isolated from postmodern morality. And then we will list those features that on the contrary are so imbued with this morality as to be inseparable from it. Thus, what attracts the radical critic of Western European modernity to postmodernism is... And now we're going to go through this list. So these are the elements of postmodernism that make it attractive and appealing to radical critics of Western European modernity. One, phenomenology and working with the notion of intentionality. Brentano, Hustrell, Meinong, Ehrenfels, Fink. Two, structuralism in the identification of an autonomous ontology of language, text, discourse. Okay, Saucere, Trubetskoy, Jacobson, Prop, and these other figures, Ricoeur, and so on. And, you know, Dugan has lectured on uh, these several topics, written books on them in some cases. Three, cultural pluralism and interest in archaic societies. And for that, you have the book Ethnosociology, published in English in two volumes, which I translated. Four, the discovery of the sacred as the most important factor in existentialism. And then all of these authors, okay, Durkheim, Eliade, Bataille, and so on. Existentialism and the philosophy of Dasein, Heidegger and his followers. Acceptance of psychoanalytic themes as a continuous dream work that subverts the mechanisms of rationality, Freud, Jung, Lacan, 
deconstruction as contextualization, Heidegger, attention to narration as myth, critique of racism, ethnocentrism, and Western supremacism, critique of the scientific image of the world and the rationality that justifies it, demonstration of the fragility, arbitrariness, and falsity of the basic attitudes of modernity, pessimism towards Western European civilization, unmasking the utopian mythologies of the bright future and progress. Now that is part of postmodernism and that's something that's valuable for those who try to criticize Western European uh, modernity, uh, political modernity. Sociology, primarily functionalism, which shows the illusory nature of the individual's claim to freedom from society and rational psychological sovereignty. We'll go a little bit further down this list. Exposition of the nihilism of the new age. New age here means the modern era, okay? Russian, nove vreme, modern era, modernity. Exposition of the nihilism of modernity, Nietzsche and Heidegger. Relativization of man in Nietzsche and Junger. The discovery of man's interiority. And you see the second figure here is important, particularly for Dugan, Henri Corbin. And political theology. Those are all postmodern uh, contributions to the criticism of modernity. Let's just quickly look at that list again. So remember, what's Dugan doing? Why can we love postmodernism? What about it can we borrow? What's good? What can we learn from it? What should we incorporate? You know, you don't want to be like those naive conservatives who ignore the discoveries of phenomenology, structuralism, cultural pluralism, the discovery of the sacred, existentialism, psychoanalytic themes, deconstruction, and all these other things. I mean, maybe you do want to be, but from Dugan's point of view, that would be a very naive, backwards kind of conservatism, one that fails to take into account the genuine lessons and insights of these various postmodern tendencies, trends, and schools. So that's that list shows us, in a nutshell, why we can love postmodernism, but that's obviously not the end of the story, so let's go on. It's worth noting at once that these fundamental trends took shape before postmodernism and existed independently of it. All of them brought something essential to postmodernity and from a certain point began to unfold in its context until they partially merged with it. But it is obvious that each of these approaches, their intersections and meeting points, their possible and real dialogues and discussions, are entirely real and possible even outside the postmodern context. Having stated this, we are bound to encounter protests from the postmodernists themselves. For them, any non-postmodern interpretation of these currents is deliberately removed from postmodernity itself and outside its context is only admissible as archaeological research. Postmodernists rigidly insist these disciplines, the ones we just went through, phenomenology and the rest of it, these disciplines, schools and movements have become objects embedded in the postmodern subject, which has seized complete power of interpretation. In other words, all these currents of thought are considered outdated, surmountable, uh, removed, I guess, uh, or whatever, um, overcome in the Hegelian sense, and uh, are not entitled to sovereign interpretation. They can only continue in postmodernism and according to its rules. In themselves, all these tendencies are not only outdated, but also toxic if taken out of the postmodern context. That's Dugan vocalizing a possible objection that postmodern thinkers would make or postmodernists would make. However, here comes his response. All these trends emerged at or around the turn of the 20th century and represent a systemic turning point in the history of modernity itself. In them, modernity is confronted head on with its fundamental crisis, its failure and its inevitable end. What is important, however, is that this confrontation occurs even before postmodernity acquires its explicit characteristic features. All these tendencies enter postmodernity, founding its intellectual climate, shaping its language and conceptual systems. But in modernity itself, they're present in a different context, guarded by the orthodoxies of thought, precisely those on whose critique postmodernity itself bases its liberating pathos. Let's keep reading, then we'll comment. Just as modernity replaced traditional pre-modern society on the wave of anti-dogmatism, but soon formulated its own dogmatism, just as communist regimes which seized power under the slogan of combating violence and oppression gave birth to brutal totalitarian systems based on violence and oppression many times over, so too postmodernity rather quickly acquired an exclusivist and tyrannical character. The paradox is that postmodernity elevates relativism to a universal value, but then defends this conquest with the most brutal and globalist absolutist methods. Transgression is transformed from a possibility into an imperative, and an increased focus on pathology becomes the new norm. Henceforth, everything that preceded the formation of the system is subject to strict exclusion. We just saw. So some of the things that are present in 
post-modernity, but that can be treated somehow independently of its outlooks. Okay, all of these authors and all of these themes, post-modernism wants to um, claim for itself and it will not allow anybody to read it or study it in any other way, Dugan is arguing. If we look carefully at the list above, we can see that in part these movements in philosophical schools think of themselves in the context of the modern, but as movements of thought that have discovered the inadequacy or defect of the modern, and in part, though much less frequently, propose more radical conclusions that the modern as a whole is an obscure, perverse, nihilistic, and erroneous phenomenon. In other words, they're critics of modernity, which makes them valuable for anybody studying that tendency of thought. But now we move on to the list of characteristics that for Dugan uh, are to be rejected in postmodernism. So what I like about this article, why I wanted to read it with you is some people are either all in or all out when it comes to postmodernism. And Dugan reminds us that you can do this operation of going through and seeing what's useful, what's harmful. Uh, doing the wheat from the chaff and all of that. Let us now highlight the characteristics of postmodernism that are probably responsible for this totalitarian renaissance. One, progressivism. This time, however, it is paradoxical since progress is now seen as the dismantling of faith in a bright future, the overthrow of utopia and the project. We can call it black progressivism or dark enlightenment, uh, referencing Nick Land. Materialism. This is not simply an uncritical inheritance from modernity, but a superior attitude, since earlier forms of materialism are recognized as too idealistic. Now real materialism must be justified, with references here to Deleuze and Kristeva. And if you guys ever want me to pull up the footnotes so you can see exactly what he's referring to, in other words, what work he has in mind, let me know in the chat and I'll do that. Relativism. All universalism is criticized, the reduction to unifying higher instances of the surrounding multitude, which is projected onto all forms of vertical hierarchies and taxonomies. Relativism itself is elevated to unquestionable dogma in Leotard, Negri, and Hart. Okay, these are things that Dugan says we have to reject from postmodernism. Okay, progressivism, materialism, relativism. Go on to post-structuralism. Let's see. Recognition of the structuralist method as insufficient because it does not cover historical and social dynamics and prohibits or consciously preaches mutations, hence the call to overcome structuralism in Foucault, Deleuze, and Barth. Radical criticism of tradition, which clearly Dugan can't accept as a traditionalist. Tradition is regarded in the spirit of Marxism, especially by Hobsbawm, uh, as a bourgeois fiction, opium of the people. In this way, any hint of a sovereign ontology of the spirit is completely eliminated. Modernity itself is seen as a resurgence of tradition, and this observation has the status of a verdict. A new critical and skeptical universalism, the obligation to subject all generalizations to ridicule and ironic decomposition, in parallel with the shift of attention to heterogeneous fragments, ontic fractals, the morality of total liberation and the overcoming of all boundaries, transgression, in Foucault, Deleuze, and so on. Anti-essentialism, from Heidegger's analysis of Dasein, a hasty and perverse conclusion is drawn, about the viciousness of the very concept of essence, and being is so placed in becoming, even in bodily becoming, that the question of essence, let alone species, is rejected at the root. Uh, that won't fly. So that has to be uh, denied from the postmodern uh, canon of principles and thoughts. The annulment of identity. All identity appears temporary, playful, accidental, and arbitrary. Only the overcoming of identity, not its construction, becomes moral. So that's like an anti-identitarian postmodernism as opposed to an identitarian one, something like that. Um, gender theory, okay, the discovery of autonomous ontologies of oppressed minorities and classes becomes a total compulsion to relativize gender as well as age within the limits of any species identity. The construction of postmodern models of psychoanalysis, and I'm just going through this list and then we'll review it uh, quickly once more. The construction of postmodern models of psychoanalysis with the attempt to overcome the structural themes of Freud and even Lacan. Fierce hatred for all hierarchy and verticality against the metaphor of the tree. Radical democratism up to the apologia of schizo masses and dividends, uh, divided selves, dismembered into sovereign and separate constituent organisms, the parliament of organs. Nihilism. Here the affirmation of modern nihilism is transformed into a conscious valorization of nothingness, into a will to nothingness. Nothingness ceases to be a pejorative concept and is assumed as a goal. The annulment of the event. Post-humanism, the exhaustion of the human uh, beginning as the bearer of a too traditional verticality. Looks like referring to Bernard Levy there. 
The invitation to transcend the human into hybrids, desire machines, cyborgs and chimeras, deep ecology and so on. And uh, apology of minorities, equalization between archaic organic cultures and artificial mechanical subcultures, artificial organization of networked communities of perverts and the mentally ill. So let's just super quickly review where we are here in the article. Dugan says, post-modernity has some things in it that we may want to preserve as well as others that we may want to reject. So let's go through the list of reasons why we can love post-modernity. And here you saw what attracts the radical critic of Western European modernity to post-modernism is phenomenology, structuralism, discovery of the sacred, cultural pluralism, interest in archaic societies, existentialism, Heidegger, psychoanalysis, uh, and these other things here, criticism of the scientific image of the world, the work of Nietzsche, Junger, Schmidt, Agamben, Heidegger, political theology, and all of that. But of course, that can't be the final word because all of those disciplines, tens, and trends of thought got totalized and absolutized by a postmodern um, progressivist outlook. And so Dugan then says, all right, fine. So what is to be rejected in postmodernity? What is it that we need to uh, separate from the trends, tendencies, and schools that we think are valuable, especially to the extent to which they offer criticism of modernity? And he then produces this list, progressivism, materialism, relativism, post-structuralism, criticism of tradition, the, its universalism, its uh, morality of total liberation, anti-essentialism, annulment of identity, gender theory, and so on, all the way up to the uh, networked community of perverts and the mentally ill. So now we continue. Post-modernity as the nihilistic finalization of modernity. If we look closely at these points, we can clearly see that post-modernity is not just a continuity with modernity, but a taking of modern morality to its logical limit. In this list of postmodern traits, we see already unequivocally, unlike the first list, a critique of modernity from the left. That is, sadness that modernity as we know it was not able to bring its attitudes to their fullest realization, and that postmodernity is now ready to take on this difficult task. Let me just interject a quick comment here, because it's an argument Dugan makes often. Modernity, for example, was dedicated to um, overcoming oppression, but it wasn't able to overcome the oppression of identities like gender and human identity as such. So postmodernity has to take that a step further. Okay, that's the kind of argument. In this case, postmodernity reveals itself as the finalization of modernity, the attainment of its telos. If, however, modernity carried out its work of emancipation under the conditions of traditional society, right, from which it was trying to emancipate itself, now the starting conditions are modernity itself, which this time must be overcome. Hence the totalitarian and Bolshevik character of postmodern epistemologies, which fully embrace the theory of revolutionary terror. Modernity must be eradicated precisely because it is not modern enough, because it has failed in its mission. The entire structure completely reproduces the logic of Marxism. In other words, I comment here, I interject, right? Postmodernism is a leftist phenomenon. Uh, the bourgeoisie is a progressive class compared to feudalism, but the proletariat is even more progressive and must overthrow the power of the bourgeoisie. Along the same lines as postmodernism, modern is better than pre-modern, but postmodernism is as inevitable as its overcoming, overcoming from the left. Okay, give me a second here. I'm just going to have a sip of my coffee. Good to be with everybody. We're reading this article, Alternative Postmodernism by Alexander Dugan. Just to give us a sense of how he thinks about postmodernism, it's uh, what it has to offer and what should be rejected in it. And I hope you're enjoying this. So just give me a moment and we'll continue. <clears throat> Let us now examine the lines we have noted as interesting. In other words, the first list, I suppose. If we separate them from postmodernity and especially from those sides that we have recognized as unacceptable, we obtain a whole series of theories, schools, and approaches that form a certain wholeness. And this wholeness only becomes visible after subjecting postmodernity itself to deconstruction and separation. The fact that all these tendencies developed independently of postmodernism, before it and outside of it, allows us to conclude that we're dealing with a completely different and autonomous set of ideas. All of them are based on the recognition of the fundamental and decisive crisis of modern Western civilization. Dugan here in parentheses, Guenon's crisis of the modern world. They seek to identify the point in history where the fatal errors that led to the current state of affairs were committed, identify the main tendencies towards nihilism and degeneration, and propose their own scenarios for getting out of the situation. 
some more, some less radical, from course correction, taking into account the newly discovered epistemological dimensions, to direct rebellion against the modern world or conservative revolution. The fixation on the nihilism of Western European modernity, and in particular, on the purely negative phases revealed in the 20th century, relates these lines to postmodernity and allows them to fit into its context to a certain extent. But if we take a closer look at this set of theories and currents, we see they can be harmonized with each other, albeit relatively, on the basis of a completely different semantic vector, they propose to liberate modernity above all from that side of it, which, on the contrary, has become dominant in postmodernity. So I'm going to continue with this in a minute, but I just want to make sure you understand, even though I assume that you do. You have these various trends and tendencies of thought, like phenomenology, existentialism, and so on, present in modernity, but they weren't originally developed in the way that they're interpreted by postmodern thinkers, which tends to be leftist. They were kind of right-wing critics of modernity and not left-wing critics of modernity. So you can do the operation of subtracting the postmodern influence from those schools so that you're left with them, and then trying to find some new context for them, an alternative postmodernism, as Dugan is calling it in this piece. Or you can say, you know, they had been, appro to the extent that they were critics of modernity, they were appropriated by left postmodernism, which was also a criticism of modernity. But they actually fit together more correctly as a right-wing criticism of modernity. So some sort of operation like that, okay? You have Heidegger on the left, but if you subtract the influence of the left from the interpretation of Heidegger, you're left with something else that is a useful, viable, intellectually stimulating, full of potential and possibility uh, criticism of modernity, but that doesn't fit the existing model of postmodernity. Okay, so I think that's uh, clear enough. Let's see now his development of that idea. In other words, he writes, we're faced with a bifurcation point in the intellectual culture of the 20th century. Oh, by the way, I kind of want to tell you that uh, I did just write not quite an article, it was an interview, a written interview at the journal im1776.com uh, on Nietzsche and on this sort of argument, you know, the Nietzscheanization of the left versus the nascent or the new uh, right Nietzscheanism or the Nietzscheanization of the right. So similar sort of topic. If you want to look at something I wrote recently on the topic, you can go to im1776.com and you'll see a piece on Nietzsche there from like uh, a week ago. Okay, back to the article. In other words, we're faced with a bifurcation point in the intellectual culture of the 20th century where the general critical attitude towards modern Western civilization, its philosophy, science, politics, culture, etc., has split into two main lines. Postmodernity itself, which has become the benchmark of Western culture. Uh, Postmodernism itself, which has become the explicit and inclusive possessor of an interpretive and value core claiming uniqueness. That's what he's rejecting. And the second phenomenon, which has not been given a name of its own, having been supplanted, dismembered, and modified by postmodernism itself. And this, I think, is what Dugan is always trying to put a name to, whether it's the fourth political theory, neo-Eurasianism, uh, or other names that he sometimes uses. I think this is what he's always pointing towards. Um, yeah. I mean, I can give you proof texts if you want, but let's just continue going through this one. The absence of a name for this direction, as well as the failure to consolidate its representatives, the acceptance of most schools and currents with an isolated existence in the conditions of nascent postmodernity, and the concentration on the study of local sectorial problems and issues does not allow us to speak of this branch of critical thought in the 20th century West as something integral. The only attempt to unite these disparate strands was made by the French New Right. In part, they succeeded, but in part, this same movement of thought was labeled with a series of unprincipled positions and artificially marginalized. Thus, there was simply no name, structure, or institutionalization for a postmodern or non-postmodern alternative. However, this is not a decisive reason to accept this branch of critical thought as something spectral and to accept the hegemonic claims of postmodernism. We can consider the set of these intellectual vectors as an implicit but fairly coherent worldview. This is easy to do if we take the point of view of an alternative history in the realm of ideas. It is well known that in history, the winning side in wars, religious disputes, apolitical trials, elections, revolutions, coups d'etat, and so on, scientific and philosophical controversies and other forms of physical and spiritual agonies, does not necessarily turn out to be right, good, and on the side of truth. Everything happens in different ways, and this can be applied to the postmodern and its alternative, the alt-postmodern, okay? The alternative history of postmodernity, the postmodernity that could have been, um, or you could call it 
if you prefer in short form. My words, not his, because he doesn't use this phrase in his article, you know, right wing post uh, modernism. So let's review the directions we've identified as attractive from this perspective, starting with phenomenology. Phenomenology is important. And let me just interject here. One of the sad things that happened a couple of years ago, sad from my perspective, when Dugan's YouTube channel got nixed because he had a channel where he was publishing regularly, YouTube pulled him down. And uh, then all of his videos went over to another site where they were harder to access. They didn't load as quickly and so on. He had a fantastic lecture series in Russian on phenomenology. Really good. Okay. I tell you, as somebody who's attended many lectures uh, on philosophy, political philosophy, and uh, that kind of thing, excellent lecture series on phenomenology. Uh, of course, it wasn't translated. It was in Russian, but still much harder to access now. So this is something that Dugan knows very well and that he can, uh, that he's lectured on compellingly. I'm sorry, there's something going on outside my window. Apologize for the noise. Garbage truck, I guess. Phenomenology is important above all because it affirms the fundamental status of the subject, its ontological priority and sovereignty. It breaks with the materialist axiomatics of modernity, placing the subject of the intentional act within the very process of thought and perception. Here, the very term intentio, to head towards what is within. Brentano, the founder of phenomenology, drew this idea from European scholasticism and the radical Aristotelianism of the Benedictine order. Uh, Friedrich von Freiburg, uh, Dugan mentions here in parentheses. And by the way, okay, hold on, let me finish this, then I'll say something. Uh, which insists on the imminence of the active intellect to the human soul. And it is characteristic that Brentano himself devoted his dissertation precisely to the problem of the active intellect in Aristotle. And although phenomenology developed by Husserl and taken to its pinnacle by Heidegger is a modern philosophical movement, if one looks closely, one can recognize in it a style of thinking that predates the nominalism, materialism, and atomism of modernity. Phenomenology transcends the boundaries of modernity, but at the same time, some of its dispositions are very consonant with classical and medieval thought. Okay, now let me say something here very quickly. Those of you who don't find it interesting, just ignore. Uh, I told you how important phenomenology is for Dugan. First of all, you see it's the top of his list of things that are relevant from the postmodern tendency. That's just a quick little bit of uh, evidence for you. But look at this beautiful set of connections that you wouldn't normally hear about. I mean, whatever you think you know about Dugan or have heard about Dugan or people write about, you know, fascist this, fascist that, without any comment on his stance on the war and everything, just look, okay? Phenomenology, a school of thought that begins with Brentano. Brentano, who developed his dissertation in relationship to the active intellect in Aristotle. This is a highly important, hugely legitimate, a central, fascinating, and amazing topic in philosophy, the active intellect in Aristotle. And in this short paragraph, we have suggested that we can turn our attention. I mean, one of the positive things about postmodernity uh, that we can isolate from it is phenomenology, which immediately puts us in touch with Aristotle, with a crucial, compelling, and beautiful topic like the active intellect, with the phenomenological interpretation of Aristotle, which was the name of that lecture series by Dugan that I said got yanked off YouTube a couple of years ago. Uh, and then how often do you see authors? I'd never heard. Uh, so I learned about this person, Friedrich von Freiburg, from Dugan's lecture series, Phenomenological Readings of Aristotle. I hadn't heard about him before, a medieval thinker with a treatise on the active intellect. I mean, he's got many treatises, but one that Dugan was referring to was on the active intellect. Ended up buying and reading that. Maybe I'll pull it off my shelf and I go over it with you at some point. But the point is, um, I want people to understand, just like Dugan is saying, why could anybody be attracted to postmodernism? And now he's giving you his reasons. I sometimes still want to explain to people, why could anybody be attracted to Dugan? Because from one perspective, I know especially the people who don't like him, uh, they say there, there is nothing in him that is appealing or attractive. There's nothing you could learn from. It's just all bad. And I say, no, look, if somebody's drawing your attention to phenomenological interpretations of Aristotle, telling you about medieval treaties on the active intellect, and telling you that this is something that you can read and learn from in your analysis of contemporary modernity. Okay, I'm sorry, but that's uh, however you want to spin it. That's interesting and worth, um, you know, worth being exposed to in my view. All right, too bad that lecture series is not translated and too bad it's harder to find now, but uh, Dugan on phenomenological readings of Aristotle was a great course, which mentioned all of these figures, Brentano, Aristotle, Freiburg, Heidegger and so on. But let me continue to go on. Sorry for those quick uh, apologetics. I do still think they're necessary from time to time. Structuralism is next on his list. So let's see what he says about that. 
Structuralism is extremely interesting in that it reestablishes the priority of discourse, the subjective dimension again, over the entire field of extralinguistic subjects. While this position, which completely demolishes the approach of positivists, convinced of the primacy of real things and the corresponding atomic facts, is new in the field of linguistics as well as in that of logic and philology, one can recognize in it that attitude towards the logos, towards an ontology of mind and speech, which was characteristic of traditional society. Okay, so again, you have a modern school, structuralism, which connects you to a pre-modern interest in the logos. Just like here, you had a modern school of phenomenology, which connects you to a pre-modern interest in the active intellect. Although the conclusion about the sovereign ontology of the text seems extravagant and even grotesque in the context of the dominance of positivism, both conscious and unconscious, this is precisely how language and thought were treated in the era before the total assault of the nominalist approach. After all, the dispute over universals was essentially a polemic between those who affirmed an autonomous ontology of names, realists and idealists, and those who denied it, nominalists. Structuralism then approaches realism and idealism quite well, even if it deploys its doctrine in a different philosophical and cultural context. In other words, structuralism is kind of anti-nominalist, and nominalism is modern for Dugan, or it's the pre-modern roots of modernity, as you can read about in The Great Awakening versus The Great Reset. Once again, a certain trait constantly associated with postmodern methodologies turns out to be close to pre-modern ones. If one considers the connections of the leading structuralists, the founders of phonology, Trubetsko and Jakobsen, with the Eurasian current, the proximity to traditionalism of the main theme of Dumézil's work, sorry about the pronunciation, on the tri-functional ideology of the Indo-Europeans, uh, and these other studies with the structures of the sacred worldview, this kinship appears even more substantial and uh, evident. In other words, there's a connection between the founders of phonology and the early Eurasianists, okay, Trubetsko, Jakobsen, and so on. And this just shows you that there's a link between structuralism as a discipline and some pre-modern interests, anti-nominalist and uh, pro-realist uh, in that medieval sense. Okay, continuing. So we're, uh, we're going through the list again of things that are considered postmodern, but that can be appropriated by an alternative postmodernism. We had phenomenology, we just went through structuralism, we continue now to the rehabilitation of archaic societies. An in-depth and impartial study of archaic societies built on myths and beliefs, refuting the superficial, hasty, and false conclusions of progressive and evolutionist anthropology, allows for a completely different view of the essence of culture, which as Boaz and his school insisted above all, must be understood from within itself without questioning the semantics and ontology of each society under study. This leads to the recognition of the plurality of cultures and a minimum set of properties that can be considered universal. The exchange structures which relate precisely to the universals of each society, each have a distinctive form that defines the ontological and epistemological landscape. I already said that there's a book, Ethnosociology, which covers some of the details. And uh, there's another book recently that does a kind of phenomenology of pre modern, or let's call it here, pre-philosophical uh, societies, archaic pre-philosophical societies. I'll just put that up on screen there in case anybody's interested. Okay, also a nice book here. Might have heard of recently, but let's go back to the text. Sacredness. The discovery of the sacred as a special phenomenon has occurred synchronously in sociology, religious studies, and traditionalist philosophy. While traditionalists have taken up the position of the sacred directly, recognizing its loss in modern civilization as a sign of degradation, sociologists have limited themselves to describing it in detail, while comparative religion, as well as some currents of psychoanalysis, especially the Jungian school, have shown how elements of sacredness in the world remain stable, even in those cultures that are based on rational materialist principles. Postmodernity actively uses the theme of the sacred, but only to devastatingly criticize modernity, which has failed in practice to truly embody its principles. Instead of cracking the world, it has only produced a new set of myths. Postmodernity does not rehabilitate myth, on the contrary, it wants to eliminate it, but more radically and decisively than the Enlightenment did. But such an intention was not present among sociologists, nor among researchers of comparative religious studies, nor among pragmatists such as William James, let alone traditionalists. Therefore, we can easily identify the vast area of the study of the sacred as an independent field, completely ignoring the postmodernist approach and corresponding strategies. Okay, another example, 
The theme of the sacred is present in postmodernity, but we subtract the postmodern leftist interpretation of it, and we're left with the study of the sacred as an independent field, one that is not necessarily modern, that can help us to think about the limits and character of modernity, but that is not skewed by the dogmas and axioms of left postmodernism. Okay, you guys see the gist. Uh, we're going to continue to go through. Let's just uh, complete the article. So again, I hope you're enjoying this. We're reading Alexander Dugan's article, Alternative Postmodernism, to see how he thinks about postmodernism and what we can learn from his analysis. Dasein philosophy. Proving that Heidegger's philosophy is a vast and autonomous field of ideas makes no sense. In other words, it's so obvious that it doesn't need proof. It's equally obvious that Heidegger's own intentions toward the new beginning of philosophy have nothing to do with the basic attitudes of postmodernity. I interject here. I once wrote an article, Heidegger, Left and Right, where I tried to make this distinction in my own way on the basis of what I learned from Dugan. Heidegger's echoes reached postmodernity through his interpretation, already quite selective and distorted. In the French school of existentialists, Sartre, Camus, and so on, and in the postmodern context, they were transformed beyond recognition. If one wishes, one can detect in Deleuze's fundamental concept of the rhizome, a distant echo of Heidegger's Dasein, but here it is more of a crude materialist parody than a real continuity. And uh, this here, the issue of Heidegger, I wrote my dissertation on that topic, which was published as a book called Beginning with Heidegger. If you want to look at that, go ahead. You can go to heideggerbook.com. And find it there. Psychoanalysis. The field of psychoanalysis is obviously broader than postmodernism as Heidegger's philosophy. So just like Heidegger's philosophy, so too psychoanalysis is broader than its postmodern interpretation. That said, the most valuable thing about psychoanalysis is its assertion of an autonomous ideology, excuse me, autonomous ontology of the psyche, a realm of the unconscious in relation to the external world, which derives its semantics and status not so much from the structures of subjective rationality, as from the complex mechanisms of the invisible workings of dreams. At the same time, psychoanalysis must not be reduced to a single model of interpretation in the spirit of orthodox Freudianism, Jungianism, or Lacan's model. The anti-Oedipus of Deleuze and Guattari and feminist psychoanalysis are rather marginal phenomena that in no way, contrary to the rather totalitarian claims of the postmodernists, nullify other systems of interpretation. In a way, psychoanalysis rehabilitates the realm of myth and the structures of sacredness which in the case of Jung and some of his followers comes close to traditionalism and the rejection of the narrow rationalism of modernity, probably the most popular representative of Jungian uh, religious traditionalism in the public eye today, I would guess, is Peterson, that Urano seminars provide ample illustration of these points of contact. Deconstruction. Deconstruction proposed by the postmodern philosopher Jacques Derrida is a development of the method of philosophical destruction justified by Heidegger in Being in Time, as we've already mentioned. Heidegger originally intended to place a philosophical school theory or terminology within the deliberately defined structure of the history of philosophy. In Heidegger's own case, this structure was defined by a process of gradual oblivion of being until the very question of being and its relation to being was removed. Okay, guys, if you don't know Heidegger, I have many, many free videos on Heidegger, many courses on Heidegger in my school, millermanschool.com. I have a lecture on Heidegger in this philosophyintro.com, free introduction to philosophy, so you must learn Heidegger. Don't, uh, <laughs> you, you must learn Heidegger, okay? If you're interested in all of these topics, Dugan and the other authors he's mentioning, it's going to be to your benefit to spend some time learning Heidegger. In this sense and in a broader context, deconstruction can be applied in a wide variety of disciplines to recover the original positions of what the late Wittgenstein calls the language game. It's a thorough and correct semantic analysis that takes into account all layers of meaning from the point at which a term, idea, or theory, as well as a story or mythological narrative first appears, to a careful analysis of the context in which the semantics has changed, been distorted, gone through breaking points and shifting phases. Again, the Heideggerian model of the history of philosophy, relevant and productive in itself, need not be taken as the only one. So deconstruction, Dugan says, can be a valuable thing for you to appropriate from postmodernity because it means identifying the structure of a history of thought so to speak, okay? Derrida used that idea in a certain way, Heidegger developed it in a certain way, but more broadly, it can be valuable uh, to apply freely, not necessarily following their applications of it. Okay, myth analysis. The study of myth as a sustained writing of interconnected images, figures, actions, and events allows us to elucidate the characteristic features of narratives often belonging to very different eras, situations, and cultural strata. If deconstruction seeks to find the original core of a separate body of knowledge or episteme, 
and trace its developments and mutations. Myth analysis, on the other hand, aims to identify similar patterns and algorithms of culture and different areas of consciousness, uh, confirming structural unity, which in some ways is what Dugan does in his Noomakia book series. In some cases, myth analysis can be closely aligned with Jungian psychoanalysis. In other cases, it can be applied to completely different phenomena in the fields of sociology, anthropology, political science, and cultural studies. So again, we're continuing to go through the list of things that Dugan believes we can borrow uh, or take from postmodernity independently of postmodernism's leftist orientation and use them for elaborating uh, systematic and thoughtful criticism of modernity. Next on the list is differentialist anti-racism. The critique of all forms of ethnocentrism, and in particular of claims to construct hierarchies between peoples, cultures, and different types of societies, need not be based on extreme individualism, a prioristic apology of any minority, and legitimation of deviance. You remember that where he says you put the uh, perverts and so on at the top of the social hierarchy. The plurality of cultures should be recognized as a semigenic law because meanings only arise in culture and in each culture. And each culture establishes its own criteria and evaluations by which it measures itself and everything in the zone of its influence. Recognition of the complex multicultural structure of human societies leads to differentialism and the complete rejection of hierarchy. Moreover, the reduction to the individual, which is the basis of the egalitarian morality of postmodernism, destroys cultural uh, ensembles instead of protecting and strengthening them. Differentialist anti-racism, on the contrary, merely postulates differences between societies without attempting to evaluate them with the help of a general transcendental criterion, which in principle cannot exist, and any candidate for such status would only be a projection of one of the societies, nor to destroy them. I know this is a point that a lot of people don't like about Dugan, his um, idea that there's no standard for judging among cultures, but there you have it. This reading of the School of Boaz and Levi-Strauss was characteristic of the Russian Eurasians and the French New Right, but such a methodology can be extended significantly beyond their respective theoretical systems and schools. Next is the critique of the scientific image of the world. Let me just pause for a minute. I want to see uh, how much further we have to go until we get to the end of the article. Mm, okay, that's fine. We're just going to keep go. Keep going to keep going. Hopefully you're enjoying this. Just to remind you, I'm reading Alternative Postmodernism and Unnamed Phenomenon written by Alexander Dugan available at geopolitica with a k k a dot ru dot r u and i thought it was uh, interesting and worth going over so hopefully you're enjoying it critique of the scientific image of the world alternative ontologies to the nominalist naturalistic scientific framework which constitute one of the most interesting and attractive aspects of postmodernity foucault latour Feyerabend, can also be investigated and reconstructed outside the postmodern field this approach generally refers to husserl's critique of the European modern sciences, which, like everything concerning phenomenology, constitutes a completely separate and complete scientific field. So I strongly recommend those of you who haven't that you read some Husserl as well, important not only for Dugan, but also for Leo Strauss and other serious thinkers. At the same time, it is necessary to take a closer look at those scientific conceptions that existed in the pre-modern era and that have been disrupted with the advent of the modern. In Europe, we're mainly concerned with the scientific ontologies of Europe, and partly with hermeticism. However, the postmodern categorically does not do so, so it doesn't look at the, pre, the pre-modern scientific conceptions, Dugan says, building its critique of scientism solely on the desire to overcome the shortcomings of the world's scientific framework from the position of the new open uh, relativity theory, quantum theory, general field theory, modal logic, superstring theory, etc., without referring to the science of the pre-modern considering it like the scientists of modernity merely a crude approximation and a set of false prejudices. At the same time, however, it was the development of a critique of modern science on the basis of an attempt to overcome its limitations and correct its obvious errors with the rediscovery of the sacred sciences over and above the original pejorative attitude towards them that could give a completely different horizon to natural scientific knowledge as a whole. So Dugan has done this from time to time. Uh, The development of a critique of modern science on the basis of an attempt to overcome its limitations and correct its obvious errors with the rediscovery of the sacred sciences, okay, or at least with a return to some pre-modern scientific notions that, in his view, were rejected too dogmatically uh, without having first been understood adequately. 
The critique of the rationalism underlying the scientific approach, as well as of the rigid Cartesian dualism and the crude mechanism of Newton's materialist ontology, leads on the one hand to a more subtle and nuanced understanding of the mind, and on, which remember, active intellect, oh, you see he's gonna mention that in a second, and on the other hand, rehabilitates Platonic and Aristotelian notions of the ontological superiority of the mind, in Aristotle the active intellect, and in Plato the divine nous. And from this beginning, it is possible to develop new scientific ontologies by properly understanding the conceptions of nature inherent in the cultures of antiquity in the Middle Ages, instead of the parody with which the history of science is confronted today, to relate them to the conclusions of the latest trends in science. This would be extremely fruitful, but the progressive dogmatism of postmodernism rigidly blocks this direction. Outside postmodernism, there are no obstacles to such a quest. So you see interesting here too, postmodernism and criticizing uh, modern science, it could have opened the door back to a serious study of the active intellect and noose, for example, and tried to correlate that with um, the latest trends in science, but postmodernism rigidly blocks the possibility of return to Plato and Aristotle, and therefore, again, we do this operation of liberating these trends of thought from their postmodern context. The critique of modernity in general, in the case of postmodernists, repeats the logic of Marx's critique of capitalism. Marx believed that capitalism was an utterly abominable phenomenon that had to be combated, but he recognized its historical inevitability and even its progressiveness in comparison to other pre-capitalist formations. And on this basis, drew a strict line between those who, like him, criticized capitalism from post-capitalist positions and those who rejected not only capitalism itself, but also its necessity, inevitability, and utility. This was the case with many supporters of conservative socialism, German patriots like LaSalle or Russian Marodniki. The same applies to the critique of modernity. If postmodernists believe that the modern represents a catastrophe and a failure, at the same time they accept its morality and the emancipatory goals it set itself, uh, and which, however, it failed to achieve. Despite the correctness and sometimes relevance of this critique, it, like Marxism, suffers from the exaggerated importance of modernity as destiny, whereas it is only a matter of choice. One can choose modernity, or one can choose something else such as tradition. The willingness to ally oneself with all opponents of modernity is the main characteristic of those who truly reject it. The sharpest and most ruthless criticism of modernity comes from the traditionalists. It's no coincidence that the French philosopher René Allot called René Guénon an even more radical revolutionary than Marx. When critics of the modern world, for example, André Gide, to some extent Antonin Artaud, Georges Bataille, Ezra Pound, or Thomas Eliot, as well as some Dadaists and Surrealists, are willing to take Guénon's and Ebola's ideas seriously in their merciless critique of modernity, their own arguments take on a special significance. Otherwise, they lose much of their sharpness and find themselves afflicted by the very disease they are about to eliminate. Pessimism about Western European civilization. All this applies to the pessimism about Western European civilization in its current state. It is criticized from the left, such as Henri Bergson, Sartre or Marcuse, and from the right, such as Nietzsche Spengler, the Junger brothers, or Sioran, Kioran, and what they have in common, and insofar as the appeal to the alternative extends into the future and draws inspiration from the past, both of these approaches have much value. However, to see this civilization as something other than disease, deviance, or at worst, the great parody and the reign of the Antichrist is to consciously accept its internal logic to recognize its legitimacy. Outside of postmodernity, such a dialogue between right wing and left wing critics, however difficult, remained possible. Postmodernity has completely closed this path. Okay, that's another topic I would say that Dugan is in general interested in the ability to have a dialogue between apparently opposite tendencies, trends, and schools. Postmodernity has closed that off because it's gone all in on the modern uh, continuation of modernity as opposed to a proper rejection of it and one that has too much in common with the left. Okay, a quick pause here just because I want to have a sip of my cup of coffee. Great to be with you. Thank you for being here. I hope that you're getting something out of this. Uh, like, share, subscribe, etc. I have a bunch of courses on everything, but we're just going to continue the article. I just want to have a sip of my coffee. All right, shall we go on? Let's go. The theses of sociology as a science that emerged in late modernity, have great validity in the study of the relationship between society and the individual, and above all, in the discovery of how fundamental the superiority of society is 
that it generally determines the entire content of its members. Durkheim called this functionalism. The individual in society is not defined by himself and his supposed autonomous content, but by the totality of social roles, masks, and functions performed. However, many different conclusions can be drawn from this fundamental sociological statement. The examples of Tunis, Sombart, Sorokin, Pareto, Dumont, etc. show that there's no unambiguous dominance in the development of society, and there are no universal regularities. It is possible to see cyclical processes, recessions and rises, epochs of development and decay in societies, but it is not possible to construct linear patterns. And so the spearhead of liberal morality, which demands the liberation of the individual from collective identity, is completely rejected. And the liberal reading of the logic of history as a progressive process of liberation proves to be an untenable chimera. Sociology brilliantly unmasks many modern myths that have the status of truths or social laws, even though they are in fact mere power ideas that are used by ruling elites for purely selfish purposes. Sociology unmasks progress as an untenable and unsupported prejudice. Postmodernity relies on sociology, but only to find new exotic strategies for the liberation of the individual and the progressive mutations of society. Transgression, changing gender roles, the transition from paranoid collectives to schizophrenic masses, the invention of individual languages, etc. This is not a return to the general from the individual, but a further fragmentation of the individual towards the sub-individual, towards a parliament of organs, and a factory of micro-desires, as Deleuze imagined the functioning of the unconscious. Outside this context, sociology still retains all its hermeneutic potential, restoring the ontological status of the general and placing the individual rather than, excuse me, uh, placing the individual rather than the individual, a uh, placing I'm not exactly sure. There's maybe a mistake here. Let's see. Outside this context, sociology still retains all its hermeneutic potential, restoring the ontological status of the general holism and placing, maybe it means here, placing the person rather than the individual at the center, uh, a distinction there. I do want to say to you, um, as we go through this, that uh, I mentioned already, Dugan has a book called Ethnosociology, where you can see how he reviews all of these different schools of thought. Uh, including Sorokin, including, I think, Tunis, if I'm not mistaken, Dumont, and so on, and shows why the, socio why the various schools of sociology can be helpful. So if you want the details, you should look at the book called Ethnosociology. Uh, yeah, there's also, there are also some good uses of that approach, I mean, of, uh, of approach of ethnosociological studies in this book, Selective Breeding and the Birth of Philosophy, in particular in Chapter 1. All right, let's continue. Nihilism. The nihilism of modern Western society was discovered and fixed long before postmodernism. Nietzsche had already discovered this fundamental phenomenon in some detail, and Heidegger, developing his ideas, constructed his own theory of nothingness. Indeed, Heidegger's entire philosophy is a search for such paths of thought, following which it would be possible to escape from the nihilist labyrinth. The problem of nothingness has been posed here in the most serious way and remains in all its gravity. Okay, in other words, Nietzsche and Heidegger, have they been appropriated by the left? Yes. Should they be uh, taken back? Yes. The postmodernists have hastened to declare a monopoly on nihilism. Instead of discovering the tragic nature of postmodernity, excuse me, the tragic nature of modernity or problematizing it, they turned it into an easy ironic trope. Deleuze proclaimed the will to nothingness as the main motivation of postmodern culture. In this way, a hasty and partly cynical answer was given before the depth of the question was fully understood. Postmodern nihilism resembles hooliganism and euphathism. Uh, I don't know what that is. More than serious philosophy. Okay, postmodern nihilism resembles hooliganism more than serious philosophy and attempts to give versions of this unsuccessful joke the status of an epistemological principle in Francois Laurel's non-philosophy or Ray Brazier's transcendental nihilism definitively dogmatize the product of philosophical failure. Okay, it tells you what Dugan thinks about those attempts. The nihilism of the modern world still needs deep reflection and most probably a radical overcoming in the spirit of Nietzsche, who defined the Superman as the victor of God and nothingness, dealt with in detail in Julius Evola's Riding the Tiger. Okay, so uh, nihilism is an important topic. The postmodernists have turned it into some sort of, uh, they've dogmatized the product of their philosophical failure. They have tried to make their uh, nihilism a kind of hooliganism. And you shouldn't let that be the last word on nihilism, Dugan says. It's still a question, a question that hasn't been fully grasped and understood, but you can make some progress with Nietzsche, Heidegger, 
and Ebola. Continuing along the lines of Nietzsche with his call to dehumanize being, many 20th century thinkers raised the question of man's limits and questioned his central position in being. Ortega y Gasset drew attention to the dehumanization of art. In turn, Junger described the phenomenology of the displacement of human nature itself by the technocratic structures of modernity. From this starting position, thought could go, and indeed did go for a long time, uh, for a time, in different directions. For example, towards the ethology of Lorenz, the theory of the environment of Jakob von Uxkoll, the critique of technology by Friedrich George, brother of Ernst Junger, or the ecology of the mind of Bateson. Postmodernity has placed this position in the glorification of mutations, the call for the creation of chimerical biomechanical species, and the denunciation of all essentialism. The struggle against anthropocentrism has surpassed all limits of reasonableness and with the support of cognitive science, behavioralism, and digital technology has turned into a veritable project of the elimination of man as a species as glorified by futurologists extolling the singularity such as Yuval Harari or Ray Kurzweil. Uh, reading a book on that topic right now called Dark Eon. Okay, so... Dugan says, there's something about the relativization of man that is worth thinking about, but postmodernity has taken it to the point of view of the elimination of man, and that's a step too far. Next point, the discovery of the inner dimension of man. The discovery of the inner dimension of man, although summarized by the modernist Bataille in his essay, The Inner Experience, is by no means the prerogative of the moderns. Already the Apostle Paul wrote about the inner man. The very doctrine of the soul, characteristic of traditional religions, speaks of exactly this. Modernity, with its reliance on materialism and the theory of evolution, has almost completely lost this dimension, building its epistemology and psychology on the model of a man without a soul, i.e. without a sovereign inner dimension. The fact that this dimension was spontaneously discovered by some avant-garde artists, surrealists, nonconformists, etc., in the course of their immersion and understanding the crisis of modernity, does not mean that the inner man is a 20th century discovery. How could he be, right? We already saw the Apostle Paul wrote about it. Characteristically, in parallel with this spontaneous discovery, the traditionalist Julius Evola and his master René Guénon provided the most extensive descriptions of radical subjectivity. The same line was actively developed by the personalists who followed Mounier and Henri Corbin and his followers, listed here, gave it a more pronounced meaning in the figure of the angel, quoted in the same context by Rilke and Heidegger as a comment on his poetry. And you should know, by the way, just to, to go up to this, descriptions of radical subjectivity, a very important concept in Dugan's philosophy, or a very important notion, a figure, if you will, is that of the radical subject. I've always tried to point that out, and I want to point it out here again, okay? The discovery of the inner dimension of man leads to an account of what Dugan calls the radical subject. So if you're a student of Dugan's philosophy, you want to make sure to pull on that thread. Consequently, in postmodernity, this theme is secondary and critical realists in general are radically opposed to any reference to the inner dimension, unless it is the inner dimension of things themselves, completely devoid of any connection to Dasein. And here he refers to Harman and his object-oriented ontology. Outside the postmodern context, this issue is again the problematic of the radical subject. And here I told you it was important for Dugan, look at what he calls it here, the most important issue in philosophy. Okay, when, when, it, when somebody who's pretty intelligent and thoughtful says something to you like that philosophy is the most important topic there is and the most important issue in philosophy is that of the radical subject, that is, uh, you want to take note of that. Okay, continuing. I think we're close to the end. Yeah, two more to go. Then we'll pause and then we'll stop. Uh, political theology. Political theology was formulated as a theory of the philosophy of the political by Carl Schmitt. The fact that Schmitt's ideas have been developed by left-wing philosophers close to modernism, Taubes, Mouffe, Fagamben, uh, does not change anything uh, to the fact that this theory has a completely autonomous meaning and can be considered quite independently of postmodernist interpretations, bare life, that's a Gamben, negative catechism, etc., and that it is a theory of political theology. Moreover, it is in the context of the entire philosophy of Carl Schmitt, who was a consistent and convinced conservative and critic of modernity as such, that political theology is truly whole. Those of you who are new to Schmidt, I recommend you read the concept of the political expanded edition with notes by Leo Strauss at the end so that you can think through both what Schmidt said and what Strauss uh, saw in Schmidt. Schmidt who said Strauss saw through him like an x-ray. Postmodernity and alternative traditionalism. This preliminary analysis, okay, the one that we've just gone through from start to finish, 
however rough, opens up a fundamental line of thought for us. Post-modernity has seriously confused the cards in the philosophical sphere, claiming, not justifiably, to sum up the intellectual history of humanity. But by rejecting it outright, we in turn find ourselves in a difficult situation, since we are forced to refer only to the previous era of modernity, which is in fact in many respects overtaken by postmodernity, and whose arguments the postmodernists have learned to deal with easily. I'm going to comment on this in a second. Moreover, by rejecting postmodernity, we're at odds with modernity itself, which, and on this point the postmodernists are right, is really the culmination of modernist enlightenment morality, and at the same time, postmodernism's appeal to a number of critical strands, if rejected in its entirety, forces it to discard them as well. Think about those conservatives who reject postmodernity as a leftist phenomenon and are left only with modernity. That is one way you could go. But Dugan says, if you're going to reject postmodernity for all of the reasons that you might, you don't want to be just left with modernity because you actually learn something crucial about modernity from postmodernity. You know, you just need to take it in a different direction. It's very similar, incidentally. I have a, a new course in my school on Arthur Moiler Vandenbroek's book, Germany's Third Empire, in other words, Germany's Third Reich. And uh, in that book, Arthur Moiler Vandenbroek makes a similar point with respect to the um, Weimar Republic, the November Revolution, and so on, the um, liberal social democratic order after the um, fall of the minor monarchy and the Kaiser. In the German case, he says the reactionaries just want to go back. They want to reject the Weimar Republic. That's like rejecting postmodernity in this parallelism and go back to what preceded it. Modernity here and uh, monarchy there. And Arthur Moiler Vandenbroek says you can't do that because uh, we've learned something from the Weimar Revolution. Even though we reject it, we've learned something from it. So you can't go back. You can only go forward on the basis of what you learned. And he calls that uh, the conservative revolution. Okay, so similar conservative revolution orientation in Dugan's thought here. We can't just go back to modernity. We wouldn't want to do that. But we, in going forward to post-modernity, have to take a different turn. Similarly, to go back to the article, postmodernism's formal gravitation toward the sacred and the other directions we've identified as positive and constructive may in part discredit the structures of pre-modernism. Um, a direct appeal to tradition without taking into account the fundamental influence that modernity and post-modernity have had on almost all modern societies, both, we both Western and non-Western, is not possible at all, since we're separated from the pre-modern by a semantic wall in which the rays of authentic tradition are extinguished or modified beyond recognition. To reach the tradition, we must first confront the modern and post-modern. Otherwise, we will have to remain in the zone of their epistemological influence. Last paragraph, therefore, the phenomenon we have provisionally called alternative postmodernity is of paramount importance. It cannot be avoided, and we cannot do without it. Of course, the core should be traditionalism and the most radical critique of modernity. But without a lively dialogue with the intellectual environment, pure traditionalism quickly degenerates and loses its strength, turning into an impotent and unattractive sect. The postmodern alternative, on the other hand, awakens and mobilizes the inner potential of traditionalism. The traditionalist Julius Ebola undertook something similar, responding in his works to the most diverse philosophical, cultural, political, and scientific challenges of modernity without any fear of departing from traditionalist orthodoxy, because in our extreme critical conditions of cyclical decay, there simply cannot be any orthodoxy. We should do the same in the new cycle. Let me just read you this part again, because you may be surprised to hear it. Traditionalism should be the core, okay? Traditionalism and the most radical critique of modernity, but without a lively dialogue with the intellectual environment, meaning without understanding all the things that Dugan just went through, structuralism, phenomenology, and so on, pure traditionalism quickly degenerates and loses its strength, turning into an impotent and unattractive sect. I remember Dugan once writing something similar about Russian conservative and nationalist parties, where he said, look, there's no point in trying to articulate a Russian national idea without first understanding the possibility of Russian existence on the basis of an interpretation of Heidegger. Sounds weird, but he's saying something similar here. We, we can't just leave it at a pure traditionalism. It's going to be degenerate, impotent, and unattractive if it's not in lively dialogue with the intellectual environment, which means, as we saw, Gwenon, Evola, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Schmidt, and all of these other figures that you can see here 
in the uh, citations, okay? A great many of them. So I want to give credit where it's due really quickly here to the translator of this piece. As you see, Lorenzo Maria Piccini. You can look him up. I think he's done some other work on Dugan as well. I believe he offers a course on him uh, at an Italian university. So feel free to check that out. I'll show you what we've been reading here. Uh, Alternative Postmodernism and Unnamed Phenomenon, published at geopolitica.ru, political with a K. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you learned something from it. Uh, if you didn't, okay, that's all right. If you did, that's great. Feel free to comment. And then I have to make the pitch, okay? So I teach at millermanschool.com. I have free courses. Philosophyintro.com is a free email introduction to philosophy. Uh, I have this channel, which you can like and subscribe to. So if you enjoyed this, do any or all of those things. And uh, that's all. I'll see you in the next video or should I pop over to the chat for a minute? Let's go to the chat just for a second. So Dugan is not enjoying a good reputation in post-Soviet countries. Okay, well, I've heard that, you know, in some cases people say nobody knows who he is. In other cases, they've said he's hugely influential. In other cases, they've said they hate him. But, you know, I think that when we go over an article like this, you see what there is to learn from a thoughtful uh, philosopher. And then it doesn't really matter what kind of reputation he enjoys. It just matters whether you think you learned something or not. Uh, Slaughterdyke, I have heard of, but I haven't read. Okay. Sorry to say. Uh, great to see you once again. Thanks. Great to be with you. Uh, what else do we have here? Dugan is playing the postmodern game to undermine postmodernism with his alternative postmodernism. Yes, yeah, sort of. I mean, he said in some detail here, right? What he thinks is valuable, why he thinks it's valuable and why it should be salvaged. Uh, so I think that he's given us an account, a reasoned account. Doesn't mean you have to agree with him, but I wouldn't say that he was just running his mouth. Uh, the discussion is on what could be salvaged from postmodern thought, according to Dugan. I think that's right. Um, post left postmodernism is fascinating. Yes, good. So uh, I agree. I think there's a lot we can learn from this kind of analysis. Uh, <laughs> about other translators, I told you, I gave credit here to Lorenzo. There's also a young uh, scholar named uh, Yaf uh, Arnold, uh, who does good work on Dugan, including translations. I put his name there in the chat. So there are other people translating him besides myself. I was lucky to uh, make my contribution when I did. And now there are others doing the work, which is good. So, okay, there we go. Uh, I guess I can give you a general update. I'm reading this book right here. You may have heard of, you may know something about Selective Breeding and the Birth of Philosophy by Costin Alamariu, which I'm enjoying. I'll be writing a review of that before too long. Uh, there's a lot to say about it. Can't really go into the de details here, but um, you may like it if you read Strauss, Plato, The Themes of Philosophy and Tyranny, and all of that. That's a book worth being aware of. Uh, a couple of new courses in the school, one on Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Considerations on the Government of Poland. A strange book, maybe, to be teaching, but it's a good one. Rousseau was asked in the 18th century during a Polish constitutional crisis to give his advice. And this book is his advice, and it's worth reading as a statement of uh, classical Republican principles. Uh, you know, about virtue versus commerce and so on. So a course on that. And uh, I told you I recently put out a course on Arthur Mueller Vandenbroek's book, Germany's Third Empire or Germany's Third Reich which I think turned out pretty well. You can see that. Uh, so there you go. Okay, a bunch of new things. I haven't done a live stream in a while because I've been working on those courses and everything, but uh, it was good to spend the morning with you. Uh, okay, so take care. Bye.